This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. All right. Can everyone hear me? All right, morning. I hope everyone had their coffees. Hello? Hello? Yeah, can everyone hear me? Yeah, all right. Uh, we're just going to take a few brief minutes of your time just to explain um, Alex. So, um, Alex is a student research pro. Yeah, it's a student research pro like team right now, um, and it is a capstone project. So it stands for Advanced Lower Extremity Exoskeleton, and we are actually not just a research team. We are uh, like a sports team because uh, we're uh, we will be joining this competition called Cyberthon 2020, and it's going to be held in uh, Zurich next year. So this is what the competition is about. So like. It's, it's designed for people with disabilities, so they test uh, technologies such as exoskeleton and this is the category that we'll be competing in and this, this is the current progress that we have right now and you, as you can see we have been working with our, our paraplegic pilot and, and this is our current team and um, we are looking for master's students who are interested in joining our project next year. This is a very exciting project and we are also interested uh, to look for tech nerds who wants to assist us in our current project. And if you're interested, uh, we are looking for people to help jump aboard right now even because um, the competition is going to be held next, next year. So like, yeah. And so we leave our um, how you can apply from our website. And just to provide you with background, we are the first Australian team ever participating in the Cybertron 2020 competition. So Cybertron is an international competition that is um, meant to promote research and development of assistive technology. And there are six tracks in total to compete. And what the six tracks will do is they basically simulate the daily living task such as sitting up, standing up, walking, navigating through various terrains, and so on. So we are developing this exoskeleton actually in our Department of Mechanical Engineering. It's open to all different branches of engineering. And because the capstone project ends this year, and the competition starts next year, so we'll need people to continue what we have done. And immediate participation is required because you need to know how things work, you need to know um, how the technology works behind it, and yeah, so that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's fun. Yep. Thanks. All right, good morning, everyone. Great. So uh, um, there are actually a couple of uh, competitions. I mean, this is one. Maybe you heard about also uh, uh, car competition. So there's like Formula One competition. There are two cars that students are designing. One is you know, mechanical, just internal combustion engine, and one is electrical. So there is also opportunity to join that project and by the way there is a lot of control in both of these so if you look at battery management system that's all about you know control right there, there, there are other issues there as well but uh, yeah uh, uh, control is a big part of it all right so uh, today I want to uh, finish our discussion of PID control and we will look at how we can use root locus to tune PID controllers uh, we will look at uh, proportional action in more detail. We will see that integral action pretty much behaves, you know, I mean, that the consequences of integral action uh, uh, are similar to that of proportional. 
and then we will wrap up with a differential action just with some general observations. Now, what this lecture is doing, it's um, d trying to achieve two things. One is uh, we want to uh, see how root locus can be used in design, right? And another thing is you will learn about intuition on how different types of controllers affect certain classes of plants. So we will be developing your intuition on design through this lecture as well. Right? All right, so the outline is simple. I already motivated PID control yesterday, and today uh, we will just look at all these different actions, proportional, integral, and derivative action, and we will wrap up. I will talk about uh, different type of specifications. You know, I will talk about overshoot, rise, time, steady state errors for each of these. We will uh, spend more time talking about steady state errors in a couple of lectures that follow this one. Uh, that it's useful at this stage to just talk about how each of these actions would affect steady state errors to, let's say, uh, step inputs. All right, so we want to start with uh, uh, P action, but before we do, I, I, I just remind you that yesterday we talked in some detail about this example. So what is plotted here are step responses. In the first row, there are step responses of the closed loop system consisting of that plant and a controller, PID controller, whose parameters are chosen at the bottom. There are different values of parameters that we are choosing here. So, uh, and then here in the second row, the uh, uh, changes of the control input over time for the step response in the closed loop are, are, are given. So what we saw yesterday is that for proportional control, for instance, uh, as we increase the pro constant of proportionality uh, uh, or gain, controller gain, we would get, uh, in this example, uh, more and more oscillatory behavior that will settle slower and slower, right? What we also saw that proportional controller did not produce zero steady state error, but note that as we increased the gain, as we increase the gain, the responses are getting closer and closer to the desired value, which is the black line. So, so in some sense, in this example, high gain helps steady state tethers, but it doesn't help the transients. It doesn't help overshoot settling time. Uh, 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 so what we want to do now, we want to uh, consider a larger class of plants than just this plant. So this is just one example. What we want to see is uh, uh, how uh, general these observations can be made for a much larger class of plants. It turns out that some of these observations are true for, for many more plants than just this example. And we will use root locus to understand this better. So that's the, that's the goal of, uh, of, of, of this part of the lecture. So let's concentrate on proportional control. We would look at different examples because I want you to sort of um, uh, 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 remember we are building here intuition. We are not presenting general statements because if a, general, if, if a statement is true for a large class of plants, that still doesn't mean that it's true always. So I will present different examples that actually show different effects that proportional control or integral control may have right, on, 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 on stability and, and other, other uh, uh, time response uh, uh, features. So what we are doing uh, here, we are considering the simplest unitary feedback uh, uh, with proportional controller. So by the way, this proportional controller that's given here is a special case of a PID controller where integral and derivative uh, actions are zero. So we are exactly dealing with uh, this situation here, right? except that we will be playing with different plants there. We won't be just considering G0 is given there. We will be looking at different plants, and we want to see effects of the proportional action. So I note that uh, controller acts on the error, where error is really difference between the reference value and the true output, so the desired output and the true output. 
So what we want to do now, we want to understand the effects of how changing the gain would affect stability, uh, overshoots, settling time, steady state errors, etc. Because we want to see how useful this controller is in design, right? Typically in design, you are given a set of specifications on steady state error, overshoot, rise, time, settling time. Now we want to understand how playing with this parameter affects these things, right? OK, so we will be looking at all sorts of different plants uh, here, and we will be making certain observations. Right, we're making certain observations here. The first example is I use the plant uh, transfer function that's uh, given here. So this plant has one unstable pool located at one. Right? There are no zeros. It's a first order plant. Now, if we plot the root locus, for this plant, that's what it is. Root locus is basically uh, just this part of real line. It starts at one, and as we, as we increase the, the gain, the, the closed loop pole travels on this blue line. That's the root locus. You can easily uh, calculate you know, explicitly what the value of the closed loop pole is as a function of the gain. It's very easy, right? Uh, so, so what can we, what can we uh, uh, conclude here? Well, first, in terms of stability, this is what, what is already written here. The, the system, the closed loop system, would become stable eventually. So as we increase the gain, the system would be stabilized eventually. What else can we conclude in terms of settling time, for instance? Yes. So, so that's exactly right. So the higher the gain, the faster it would settle. So we will reduce the settling time by increasing the gain. How about the overshoot? What can we say about the overshoot? What would be the response of the closed loop system, step response of the closed loop system, if we have a single stable uh, 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 real pole? Laplace transform, inverse Laplace transform, take the inverse Laplace transform of the step response, what do you get? You get a periodic response, yeah? You get a periodic response. There's no overshoot, right? How about rise time? You remember rise time is related to those semicircles, right? The larger the radius of the semicircle on which the pole is, or poles are, you know, or, uh, th then the faster the, the rise time, the smaller the rise time. So increasing gain improves rise time as well. So what is the family of responses? Well, for, for uh, uh, gain that is small, we are still unstable. But as we increase the gain, we will get marginal stability. Here, the system is marginally stable. There is just a single uh, uh, pole at the origin. So if we feel that's an integrator, right? The closed loop system behaves as an integrator. If we feed a step response to an integrator, what do we get at the output? Ramp. We still grow unbounded. So even when we have the closed loop pole here at the origin, we are still growing unbounded. Now, if we increase slightly the, uh, the gain, we become stable. And then the response becomes aperiodic. It becomes like an exponential converging to the, you know, uh, to some value for infinite value. Now, there is no overshoot, but then the speed of convergence to the desired value would be smaller and smaller, and the settling time would be smaller and smaller. So both rise time and settling time would decrease as we keep increasing the game. Now, you can't make general statements. This is just an example. But what I'm trying to tell you here is there are examples in which proportional gain would have these effects. There are examples that you can encounter where you have these effects. Increasing the gain helps on all fronts. You get stability eventually. You, uh, you improve uh, 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 step response, right? All right. 
How about the double integrator? So imagine that I have a double integrator. So the, now the plant is the double integrator. The controller is still a proportional controller. If we plot the root locus for this uh, system, unitary feedback still, right? So this is the root locus. So the, the, the relative degree of this plant is two. We will have two asymptotes. And we can actually uh, uh, check that the root locus actually coincides with these two asymptotes. So one asymptote is the blue line. Another asymptote is the green line. The two poles of the open loop transfer function are both at the origin. And as we increase the gain, we sort of keep going further and further away from the origin. But we stay on the imaginary axis. So what are the conclusions here? Well, the roots of the characteristic polynomial are complex with zero real part for all gains. We never, ever stabilize the system. The system is always marginally stable. Always marginally stable. Yeah? So what would be the response of such a system as we increase gain for some positive value of, of k? We will have sustained oscillations, right? We will have sustained oscillations. It's a marginally stable system. It doesn't converge. Uh, anyway, and we, no matter what value of proportional control you use, you will never stabilize the system. So, so in this case, it doesn't make sense to talk about overshoot, rise time, because it's not a stable system, right? Uh, by the way, just these are two simple examples, and you can see already that the effects of proportional control are genuinely different, right? So there are systems where you cannot stabilize the system for any value of proportional control. So if you use proportional controller, so proportional controller is not general enough to stabilize the plant. When we, when we learn about pole placement, you would see that if I make a controller transfer function of high enough order, under very weak conditions, I can eventually stabilize. I can place poles wherever I want by the choice of controller. That's the more general result we will present later. But if you are using a single parameter proportional controller, there are severe limitations to what's achievable. Okay? All right. So let's now consider a much larger class of plants. So what I'm considering here is a class of plants where I have this uh, transfer function G. Now, G tilde has all zeros and poles with strictly negative real part. But then there are potentially either one or zero uh, uh, poles at the origin. So there may be one pole at the origin when k is 1, or there is no poles at the origin when k is 0. Yeah? So, so but what this means is G has uh, all poles uh, are stable except for one, potentially one at the origin, and all zeros are stable. So we want to analyze now how proportional control affects this large class of plants. This is a large class of plants now, right? By the way, the example I considered here belongs to this class of plants. They are k is 0. So there is no poles at the origin, and all other poles are at minus 1. They are with strictly negative real part. So this, uh, this plant does belong to the class I consider. So now I want to state certain like, general conclusions on how proportional control affects this class of plants. So assume that we, we, we stabilize the system. So we suppose that we chose the value of proportional control that renders the closed loop stable. And then let's consider what happens with steady state errors. Well, steady state error is, by definition, uh, limit as time goes to infinity of the error. Error is the difference between r and y, right? So, and this, since we assume that the system is stable, right, we can apply final value theorem. So this step here requires this stability assumption. If I find what E of s is for this case, I can rewrite everything in this way. By the way, in your lecture on uh, uh, sensitivity transfer functions, you can maybe remember that this guy here is the sensitivity, output sensitivity transfer function. 
So, so basically, if I now pick different values of R of S, I can test what would be the steady state error for maybe step input, for ramp input, etc. Right. So if R is 1 over S, that would correspond to the step input. So if I have 1 over S, well, this S and that S would cancel. And what I get is 1 over 1 plus K gamma tilde at 0. So if K is uh, a 0, so basically if, there is, if plan didn't have an integrator in it, then this is what I would get. Or else, if plant did have an integrator at zero, then g tilde, uh, sorry, g at zero would be actually infinity because we are dividing something by zero, and then the steady state error would be zero, right? Can everyone follow this uh, this step here? So I'm, I'm 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 considering here two cases. One is when k is zero. In that case, there is no integrator. In that case steady state error is equal to this. When there is one integrator in the plant, in other, way, uh, in other words, uh, k is equal to 1, then I would have that, uh, here I would have g tilde divided by 0, g tilde at 0 divided by 0, because g tilde doesn't have any uh, uh, eigenvalues with, uh, at 0, right, or, or zeros at 0 then this would be a finite value. But we are dividing by s, which is tending to 0. So this whole thing would be infinity. So we are dividing all of this with infinity. So 1 over infinity uh, is 0. So that's how we get steady state error 0 when there is an integrator in the plant. If we apply ramp input, then we would see that r here is you know, 1 over s square, right? So, so we have to repeat the calculations. And then, again, if plan doesn't have an integrator, the steady state error is infinity. But if the plan does have an integrator, then this would be the steady state error to a ramp uh, uh, input. Now, why, why is this important? Well, uh, note that here, depending on the plant properties and depending on the gain, we can have different possibilities for steady state error. Note in particular that when the plant does not have an integrator here, then increasing the gain would help reduce the steady state error. So this formula here tells you that we are dividing by you know, k, right? 1 plus k times gamma tilde at 0. Gamma tilde at 0 is some number, right? It's just a fixed number. It's a DC gain for g, g tilde. And then this thing here would reduce as k is increased to infinity. Now, remember what we had in the example uh, before. As we increase the gain, the steady state error was reduced. That's exactly what we just analyzed in this general, more general class of plants. So what, what we are observing here in this example, that we had the same effect. As k is increased, we have smaller and smaller uh, uh, steady state error. It's never zero. It's never exactly zero. But it's reduced as gain is increased. Any questions? I will, I will slow down now. I, I see lots of you are sort of confused. So who's the, who's the bravest to ask a question? All right. So when k is equal to 0, then forget about 1 over s. Right, because s to power 0 is just 1. So this is all, there's no s to power k. There is only g tilde. OK? And g tilde has all zeros and poles that are strictly stable. So they are with strictly negative real parts. They are in the left, left half plane. All zeros and all poles of g tilde are in left half plane. So then we are saying, all right, if we plug the, the, the formula so, so this is, we assume stability, we can use the final value theorem, right? So this is basically s times e of s. Well, we need to just calculate what e is in this case. Well, what is e? e is r of s minus y of s. But y of s is really the closed transfer function times r of s. So I'll, I'll just do the, those calculations so that you perhaps can... Uh, a little bit better. So what we are dealing with here uh, 
I will just use S's everywhere. So what is the error? Can everyone see this? Yeah? So what is the error, equation for error? R of S minus Y of S. But what is uh, Y of S? Well, it's the closed loop transfer function, but closed loop transfer function is kg over 1 plus kg of s, and everything is timed with r of s. Note, this thing here times r of s is exactly y of s. I just took r out and put everything in the bracket. So what is now this thing in the bracket? That's exactly this thing here, right? So I just calculated E of S. So now I'm saying, all right, uh, if I have, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, so, so, so if I don't have uh, 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 integrator, so K is 0, forget about this step because S to power K is just 1. And this S to power K is 1. So, so I still have S times R of S times this whole thing where I have here 1 and 1. Right. So when I use R of S 1 over S, that's the step. So I'm now calculating error for the step input in Laplace domain. Then 1 over S, so this S and that S cancel. So what I'm left with is 1 over 1 plus K G tilde of S. But I have to let S tend to 0. So since G tilde doesn't have any eigenvalues exactly at 0, right? They're all with strictly negative real parts then g tilde at 0 is a number. It may be 10, it may be 100, it may be 500, depending on the transfer function. So then I say that when, you know, so when I take this limit as s goes to 0, I get exactly this, right? So now I know that for any finite value of k, this is a number. So this is non-zero. This is a non-zero number for, for any bounded k, positive k. But if... I let k tend to infinity, then this steady state error would tend to zero. So that's the relationship between the gain and steady state error in this example. If I have an integrator, then what I'm left with here when I cancel s in r and this s, I have actually s here and I have s here. Now, because of this s here, as I let s uh, uh, tend to zero, I get zero overall, right? So that's why I get here steady state error zero. You can repeat the same thing, the same calculations, when you substitute here R of S to be equal 1 over S square. So, and then you get that steady state error for ramp is infinity when K is zero, in other words, plan doesn't have an integrator, or you have a finite, like bounded steady state error when there is an integrator in the plan. We will later on show that this integrator in the plant, you know, by the way, if, if k is 1, then you have here 1 over s, which is part of the plant model, but 1 over s is also a model for the reference input that we are testing for. So you will see later on that this so-called internal model principle requires either a plant or controller to have exactly the model of the reference input in order to have steady state error zero if the closed loop system is stable. We will learn this about, uh, about we'll learn about this later on and it's called internal model principle. So what you are seeing here is a special case of internal model principle. At this stage just remember that if the plant doesn't have an integrator you will not get zero steady state error with proportional control. But if the plan has an integrator, you will get steady state error uh, equal to zero uh, when uh, uh, you apply step input. All right? Any questions? All right. So we want to now uh, uh, present several other comments. And these will be stated as facts. And we will explain each of these facts separately. Right? So the first fact is uh, that for this class of plants that we are considering, we have that sufficiently small game stabilizes the plant. So it's a large class of plants, 
But what we are saying is that small gain would stabilize the plant. Then we are saying for, uh, that sufficiently high gain destabilizes the plant for a relative degree strictly higher than 2. We will show that as well. And we also we will show that for relative degree equal to 2, high gain may stabilize the system for all k, but it may reduce the damping and hence increase oscillation. So each of these is a general observation for this large class of plants. If we impose extra conditions on these classes of plants, we can say more things about how proportional gain would affect the response of the system. All right. So we now want to go through each of these facts, and we present under these conditions, we, we explain why, why this fact is true. So the, let's, let's look at the first one. So first fact was that small gain stabilizes this class of plants. So note that if there are no, uh, if, if the plant didn't have an integrator at the, the, at, at the origin at zero, right, then all poles and all uh, zeros are strictly with negative real parts. But we learned that root locus for the, uh, uh, would stay close to the poles of the open loop plant transfer function for small gain. So if all poles are strictly stable, small gain will still keep the root locus, all branches of root locus in the left half plane. If we have one uh, uh, integrator in the plant transfer function, then the only uh, 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 pole or, or zero uh, uh, on the imaginary axis would be that pole, right, at the origin. All others are with strictly negative real parts. So because of this, we know that if we are checking now what, which parts of real line belong to the root locus, well, this part definitely doesn't because all other poles and zeros are with strictly negative real part. But then this part of real axis, some small portion of real axis, will belong to the root locus. And this is exactly the branch that emanates from this pole. So all other poles are with strictly negative real parts. All other branches for small gain will stay inside the left half plane. So then we can conclude that for small gain, root locus, all branches of root locus are in strictly ne negative, uh, 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 well, left half plane. They are in left half plane of the complex uh, uh, plane. I'm again seeing a lot of confused uh, faces. We are at the stage where I am using a lot of things that we've covered, and I'm, I'm using them. Now, if you didn't learn about these, I can't help you. Uh, you have to put in work and keep up with me. Because otherwise, I mean, I can explain 500 times, but it's just not going to work. So going forward, and midterm is next week, so you guys really need to put in work to be able to follow me. Otherwise, the lectures won't be very useful to you. Right? So we need to have a, like a contract. You know, we need to work together. So you need to keep up with me. Otherwise, things I'm explaining won't sink in. You, know, you won't understand it. All right. How about, so now I'm talking about the second fact that I listed. If we have relative degree higher than 2, strictly higher than 2, then the claim is that the uh, 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 high gain would destabilize the plant. And why is that? Because of the asymptotes. We know that if the relative degree is 3, the asymptotes would look like this. It doesn't matter where they intersect the real axis. Two asymptotes would always cross into the right half plane. Maybe this sigma is here. Maybe this thing is here. So there may be two branches always in the right half plane, right? Maybe. But even if sigma is, you know, in the left half plane, for sufficiently high gain, some branches of root locus would tend to these two asymptotes, and eventually these two branches would cross into the right half plane. Similar thing happens for uh, uh, relative degree uh, 4, 5, etc. You would always, always have some asymptotes that cross into the right half plane. And hence, some branches of root locus cross into the right half plane. So for transfer functions that have relative degree 3 or higher, high gain, proportional high gain, destabilizes the system eventually. Destabilizes the system eventually. OK. How about 
the relative degree two. Uh, so the, one of the facts was saying that if the relative degree is equal to two, then we, even if we have stability, we might have stability or we might not, but even if we have stability, we would basically make the transients worse and worse because by increasing the gain, the damping would be reduced and then as a result, over should be larger and you know, rise time would be smaller, but you, know, you have overshoot that's larger and larger. So let's consider, in order to demonstrate this, let's consider just this uh, example, which is a special case of that general class of uh, 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 plots that we considered. So here we have one uh, uh, pole at the origin and one pole at minus one. So this does belong to the class of plots that I considered, where there is one pole at the origin. If you plot the root locus, this is what the root locus looks like. One pole is at zero, open loop pole is at zero, one open loop is at minus one, so two branches, green and blue. So as we increase gain, one branch sort of goes this way, one branch goes that way, and then they separate, you know, and we have complex conjugate uh, poles. As we increase the gain, what happens? Initially, we have, uh, you know, both, both poles are uh, uh, real and different, and there would be no overshoot. The damping is like one, so, so there's no overshoot. So, so as we keep increasing the, uh, uh, the gain, the settling time would be reduced, right? The settling time is reduced because we are to the left of this uh, 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 vertical line up to a point. Up, when we get to this point, then re increasing the gain higher would no longer help our settling time. The settling time would be fixed at a certain number. It would always stay the same for any value of gain up past that point. But now we have two complex conjugate poles, and if we increase further the gain, then the damping, so basically if we connect the pole to the origin, you know, with the line, then this angle would be arc sine of the damping factor. So the damping keeps uh, reducing as we increase the gain. As a result, the overshoot keeps increasing. Similarly, we are, as we increase the gain, the poles will be complex conjugate, and they would be on larger and larger semicircles, radius of semicircles on which they are, they are larger and larger. Rise time is smaller and smaller as a result. But settling time stays fixed. By the way, here, because the system is second order, closed-loop system is second order, we are talking about exact formulas. The formulas I presented in the lectures are exact. So, so this is what you get, basically. Uh, and if you plot now, different values, look, when, when gain is small, then step response is given by the red curve. That's the gain, that corresponds to the gain 0 0.25. When k is 1, you get a bit of overshoot and you settle quickly. But when k is 25, know that we have large overshoot and it takes a longer time uh, 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 to, to uh, uh, you know, converge, right? So, so, I mean, the settling time, you can check, would not change for you know, as we keep increasing the gain, we would always converge close to the infinite sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, value of the, of the uh, uh, output uh, in the same time. Uh, also because, note that all of these responses converge to the desired value, which is one. Desired value, we, we apply step, step input, and these are step responses. So desired value is one, and all of these responses converge to one. Why is this the case? Why is this the case? Integrator in the plant, that's right. Know that this example I used has an integrator in the plant. Right. All right, good. You can also check that the, when, you, when you find the closed loop poles, when you, uh, when you uh, uh, see how, this is the denominator of the closed loop system. So poles are solutions of this equal to zero. So if we rewrite everything in this form, we can find that uh, natural frequency is square root of k and damping is 1 over 2 over square root of k. So you can explicitly see that the damping is reduced as the uh, gain is increased. So this is explicitly calculated, but root locus already told us all that. We don't have to do this, right? We don't have to do this. All right. So what are take-home messages? 
P control is in general restrictive. So if I, if I gave you a certain set of specifications, it's unlikely that you will be able to achieve them for, for a plant at hand using just proportional control. Typically, you would need to use more general controllers. Uh, this uh, control also typically, uh, uh, oh, sorry, it may stabilize some plants, but it may destabilize some other plants. So we have both cases, right? Some plants were stabilized with high gain, some plants were destabilized. Uh, it typically is non-zero steady state error uh, for step ramp inputs unless the plant itself has an integrator. If the plant has an integrator, then we might have zero, we will have zero steady state error to, to step input, right? Uh, large gain may reduce steady state errors, right? When the plant doesn't have an integrator, it does reduce steady state error, but at the same time increases oscillations because the damping is reduced for relatively good two plants, and also uh, may eventually destabilize the system when we have asymptotes crossing into the right half plane. So, so you see, uh, also, this may lead to, you know, poor robustness. We will talk about robustness later on when we talk about frequency domain. By the way, in frequency domain, you can revisit root locus because in frequency domain, changing gain in the controller means you are shifting the open loop gain up and down, but the phase stays the same. So we can really reinterpret everything from root locus in frequency domain later. So we will do that. And that's when we will talk about robustness. All right, so we have just a few minutes left, and you know, there isn't much left to, to cover. Why? Because integral action actually uh, uh, is very similar to proportional action. So what I'm doing in integral case, so now I'm using integral controller, which has some constant, and I have this integrator. Now, if I take this integrator and put it into G, right, then I have exactly the case that I had before, right? So all the conclusions we had about proportional control for plants that have an integrator in them would apply to integral control applied to general plants, right? So, so uh, uh, pretty much all our intuition that we were building for proportional control still holds here. Just with this reinterpretation that I'm now taking this integrator and bulking it into this plant, this changed plant model, and then I'm analyzing again for this changed plant model what happens when I change Ki. The conclusions are the same as in the proportional control. All right, so what, what, is, what, what I just said is basically this thing here is exactly the same as this thing here because I just put this integrator here into the plant, and then I have here k plus 1 rather than k, right? So that's, that's it. And the analysis stays the same, right? So the, the conclusions are obvious. So integral action may have the same impact on the closed-loop system as the proportional action has with this extra caveat that we always have an integrator now in the open loop transfer function, which would always help steady state errors. Since we now use integral control, we are enforcing an integrator in the open loop transfer function, and hence we will have zero steady state errors. Even if the plant did not have an integrator in it, the closed loop control with integral control controller would have an integrator in the open loop transfer function. And again, it may, this may reduce damping, it may destabilize the system, it may read poor robustness. So all of these conclusions for proportional control hold here. Okay. So, so all, of this, all of this sort of analysis is exactly the same as in the case of proportional control when plan has an integrator. So we did this analysis already. I don't need to go through the steps again. Uh, I will just, uh, this, is, this is not important. I just want to say a few words about the uh, derivative action uh, before we uh, uh, finish. So what we saw in, in this case, in this example, is that as we increase the KD constant, the derivative constant, uh, we could suppress, reduce overshoots, we could suppress the oscillations. And you know, there are indeed uh, a large classes of plants for which this is the case. So, uh, the action generally damps oscillations and reduces overshoot, 
but not always. You, you do need to be careful. PID control is tricky to tune. If I give you an arbitrary plant, I can always have that these different constants affect it in different ways. You can, as an exercise, try to plot root locus for just differential control, uh, derivative, just derivative action for some plant uh, uh, models. For instance, you can use exactly the plant that we used here. So use this plant model, use derivative action, then the uh, uh, open trust of function will be s divided by s plus 1 uh, to power 3. Plot root locus of that and see, see what you get. Can you, can, you, can you guess what the root locus would be? So suppose that you use KD, S, and I have 1 over S plus 1 to power 3, and then I use unitary feedback. What is the open trust of function? I take this S here, and then I consider KD as my proportionality constant. So the transfer function I need to consider in this case is this transfer function, S divided by s plus 1 to power 3. So how do we plot root locus? We first include all the open loop uh, poles and zeros of the, uh, the open loop transfer function. There is one zero, so this s is zero at the origin. So we need to include this zero here. And then there are three poles at minus 1, right? So now, what are the, uh, 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 what would the root locus look like? Well, is this part of real, real line part of the root locus? No. So note that this part is part of root locus, right? And then, how about this one? No, because there are four, so there are three poles, one zero. There are four sort of singularities or whatever, uh, 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 poles plus zeros. For on, on the right hand side of any point on this part of real line. So this part of real line is not part of root locus. Now what's the relative degree of this guy? Two. So what would be the asymptotes looking like? So it will be just vertical. Now I'm not sure whether it will be here, I'm not sure whether it will be here, but in any case it will be somewhere probably in the left half plane. If you think about the formula that you use to calculate where the uh, uh, um, uh, asymptotes intersect the real axis, you know, it will be the sum of all zeros divided by something, right? Relative degree. So, so, so you will have two asymptotes that will be stable. So if I increase the gain, one of the branches would go from this pole here, right, one of the poles here, to zero, right? So we will be getting, you know, that high gain actually uh, sort of getting, is getting, pushing this branch closer and closer to the measure axis. In this case, you, you have that you are closer and closer to marginal stability. But two branches will sort of go up, and we will have uh, uh, larger and larger overshoots as we increase gain because of these two branches, right? So you can analyze different examples in the same way using the root locus uh, for the, the uh, derivative action. All right. So. By the way, too large gain, D, may still yield undesirable oscillations or instability, right? And what I was showing in this example, exactly, you will be getting closer and closer to marginal stability. Uh, now, in general, you would need to play with all three, you know, P, I, and D. And in that case, root locus cannot be used directly, but what you can always do, you can fix two of these coefficients and play with one and see how changing one coefficient with two fixed affects the location of closed loop uh, uh, poles. We won't do it this way because we will show that there are much better design techniques based on frequency domain uh, uh, techniques, but you know, root locus already gave us quite a lot with very simple, it's a very simple tool that we already learned a lot about effects that P, I, and D actions have on the closed loop system behavior. All right, so just to wrap up everything about PID control, PID controllers are probably the most important type of controller you would learn in this subject. It is the most important. It's used everywhere. 
So we uh, saw that these actions may have different effects on different plants. You have to be careful when you tune your, there's no general rule on how to choose these. Zygon nickels help us, but you know, it can be uh, uh, it's quite tricky. We will learn how to tune PID controllers using frequency domain techniques. That's probably the most powerful way of tuning PID controllers. It's a very, very powerful way of doing it. There are alternative tuning rules, alternative to Zygar Nichols or root locus. Astrom and uh, Mari book has a whole chapter on it, as I, said, I already recommended that chapter. And by the way, sometimes you are forced to use some more powerful controllers than PID controllers you will see that there is a result called pore placement. So if you have a plant that just doesn't have any pore zero cancellations, so, so there is no pore zero cancellation, you can show that there always exists a controller of sufficiently high order so that you can pick a transfer function of the controller so that the closed loop poles have arbitrary locations that you chose. So you tell me which pore locations for the closed loop you want and I can find you a controller of sufficiently high order that places the closed loop poles exactly in those locations. But in that case, we are using much more general controllers than PID controllers. So, so there's much more flexibility then in terms of where we can push our poles of the closed loop. So we will present that in a few lectures. Any questions? All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, that's fine. What is the flag over?